for then. But a, a national epidemic such as the one we're facing now is just not something this country was honestly prepared for. On top of that, you had, uh, this, this has been going on in China since the end of last year. There was manufacturing that was shut down there for an extended period of time. There was a backlog of goods in that country that needed to make its way out from an export standpoint. Um, and so that, uh, that accompanied by the fact that all of the large airlines are shut down um, and there's not flights that are going between China and the U.S. and other parts of, of Asia and the U.S. Um, has significantly hampered um, the ability to actually move goods. Um, you know, uh, one of the departments I run at, at Team Health is travel <clears throat> and travel schedules. Uh, if Delta Airlines, for example, is only flying 20 percent of their normal schedule at present with a 13% occupancy on that 20% of their schedule. So doing the math backwards, that comes up to about 2.9% of their revenue they're currently sitting at um, on a day in and day, day out basis. So there, there's a lot of uh, economic factors that go into this and, and uh, a lot of issues. So from a supply chain standpoint, uh, the U.S. medical uh, PPE supply chain was not prepared for this event. We did not uh, move into a position to have materials and supplies in place, and I think that's come to light within the last two weeks. Uh, the Chinese suppliers that typically supply a lot of these goods um, experience downtime and were actually using materials uh, for their own uh, needs uh, as they moved through uh, the COVID crisis. And so that lowered supply that was actually coming into the U.S. on top of the fact we did not have a, a large enough uh, warehouse of materials. Typically in the medical space, McKesson and Henry Schein and other uh, domestic companies uh, are, are the major suppliers to the hospital systems. They're very rigid in what they do with lots of regulations by the U.S. Um, the, those companies, along with the facility domestic stockpiles, became strained within about two weeks of the first COVID cases hitting in the U.S. And most of that was in Washington State, uh, followed by the New York events. Uh, the government and the FEMA supplies were, you know, as I said, suitable for regional events, but not this national epidemic. So Team Health, we recognized this uh, and started hearing issues about it uh, back the week of March 15th. And we launched a sourcing initiative to on March 18th in response to initial reports of facility PPE shortages in, in Washington State and what we were hearing in the New York area. Um, our, our first initiative was to really understand what those PPE shortages were and uh, also determine what the PPE usage was going to be, uh, which became difficult as this was not something that really our frontline staff had dealt with this type of virus before to really understand what their usage and their burn factor was going to be. But we really needed that in order to have forecasting guidance um, that we could have. So. We placed initial words for PPE on March 18th, and then on March 19th, we started an effort to try and understand what a forecasting guidance would look like. Um, we took on partners when we did this. Uh, we're owned by a private equity firm uh, out of New York called Blackstone. Um, and so Blackstone has lots of variety within their investments. So we picked up a company called Apria Healthcare out of, out of uh, California that's it's in the uh, uh, CPAP and, and uh, oxygen generator business. We picked up a company in Gallatin, Tennessee by the name of ServePro. ServePro was working to do disinfection and cleaning of uh, some of the senior living centers in Washington State and knew that there would be uh, demand for that on a go forward basis. We picked up G6, which is a hospitality company that owns Motel 6. Um, so along the way, we picked up other partners that had needs similar to ours. And what we did uh, was to uh, sort of bet across multiple vendors and multiple manufacturers in China uh, in order to uh, try and, and hedge our bets that we would receive materials and that the materials we, we received would be quality materials. Also during this time, initial guidance on materials was a N95 mask was required uh, for response to uh, COVID situations. Uh, the CDC actually opened up uh, the requirements on that, allowing uh, masks that, that met other international standards to be introduced uh, and, and made available. And so the KN95 mask, which is the Chinese version of an N95, uh, was added into the CDC approved list in response to the event as they were working through the shortages um, that occurred. So the first PPE items we ordered were, were N95 or KN95 masks. 
in order to help prolong the use of those masks, we began trying to get three ply or type three level three surgical masks um, that are more your common ear loop masks. Goggles become a necessity because of the uh, the way the virus spreads. So we looked at, at you know over OTG uh, type safety glasses or goggles, uh, face shields, and then uh, ultimately there was a need for gowns um, as the event uh, went, went to move on. So those are the main categories of items um, that are in need from a PPE standpoint. The goggles were actually able to be, we found those. Uh, through a couple manufacturers in Ohio, uh, warehouse in New Jersey, and a manufacturer in South Carolina, we were able actually to source those fairly quickly. But the majority of the other materials, the the two different types of masks and the gowns, uh, were going to have to come uh, from other places. We just were not set up to manufacture that um, in, in this country. So that's kind of the background. I know that's a, a little bit longer answer maybe than you expected, Danny, but um, I thought just kind of a historical view on this and where we're at might be important for this group. Yeah, so that, that, that is perfect and kind of leads me into my next question, which is you know, what, are you, what are your views for the next couple of weeks, your view of you know, team health uh, needs as well as kind of a, uh, a view of the country's needs and then, and then further out, you know, six months from now, when well, we have a lot of manufacturers on the country that, uh, on the call that are trying to figure out, can they help in time and can, can this be something that's sustainable? So the, the, the face shields are still a continued need, uh, which those are, you know, relatively uh, simple in manufacture. Um, I know that um, uh, I live in Blount County, Tennessee, so Denso Manufacturing here, I know they shifted some of their production out of one of their shops over and made some uh, face shields. Um, out of their shop that were available. There was a small manufacturer uh, that actually manufactures furniture over in North Carolina that reached out to me and said, hey, what can we do? And so they actually are working to make uh, manufacture some face shields uh, with some of their production line. And they're also looking at making uh, gowns. Uh, so uh, like surgical gowns uh, that could actually be laundered and reused. Um, I've talked to some of the folks in the hospitality industry and they're interested in those type of linen gowns for their housekeeping staff um, so that, you know, their folks can essentially come into work, put on a gown, go about their day, and then those materials can be laundered at the end of the day. Um, so any of that PPE that we could source locally, um, you know, the, the issue with this, these orders, um, we placed orders and, and funded on uh, March uh, 18th and 19th for masks, and we still have not received all of those orders. Um, the real issue is that Chinese uh, export customs is backed up anywhere from two to three days to get through that process. It takes another three to four days to get an airlift underneath an order. There's, they're limiting quantities of orders uh, based on, on where, what address they're going to in the U.S. So they're, they're rationing what uh, space of an airplane you can get as an importer. And then the import inspections are taking anywhere from two to three days. Um, so, in, and then another 24 hours once you come through uh, the import exercise to actually get it out to your facility. And all that comes, number one, at a, at, at a lot of time that's wasted to try and get materials to the front line. But number two, it's at a high expense. So, uh, you know, when we've looked at cost for materials, we have to weigh in what just the base cost is for the material, but then also all of the uh, shipping, handling, and freight to actually move those materials um, along with the delay in timing. So anything we can do to manufacture these products at a local level uh, would be great. The, the virus, obviously, New York City is the big headline. Uh, Detroit is probably right behind it at this point. Uh, Washington State feels like they're on the other side of the curve. The South Florida area is beginning to heat up as you watch the maps. And this is not just uh, news reports or, or, or other reports that you have. Uh, Team Health has a call three times a week, um, in which we get on the phone with the, the clinical leadership of the organization. And they give us reports of what they're seeing from volumes around the country. So uh, this is more of a, uh, from the clinical perspective than from a health department or a, a national uh, reporting perspective. But that's, that's what we're seeing. The real fear is when uh, it begins to move and migrate and we see the uptick that occurs in, in the smaller markets, the mid to small markets, those hospital systems are not as large. They probably don't carry as large of a PPE inventory. 
um, is what you're seeing, uh, you know, in some of these larger areas. And they won't get the support that some of the larger areas are, are happening. Uh, you know, people are, uh, Fox News is not going to break over to listen to probably the governor of Arkansas, uh, whereas they're going to they're going to carry the governor of New York every time he speaks, likely. So, uh, so I feel like that's where it's really going and where this group could probably really jump in and help in your local communities with some of these materials. Uh, the cloth face masks are also something that it has really taken off. Uh, that's more for administrative and, and non-clinical staff in a lot of these settings that that's being used for. But I see hospitals in the in the south continue to, it's particularly in the southeast, continue uh, to request those. But it seems to have uh, gathered some legs and, and become more of a national request for those at this time also. Thanks so much, Chris. Chris could you speak just a little bit to the number? Why you want to play? Why you want to play? Sure. Uh, Go ahead, Danny. I got it. Okay. Um, could you speak just a little bit more to what we're hearing in the news? And uh, uh, for example, uh, two point eight million N ninety five masks were uh, were announced last night. Two point eight million sur surgical masks. Um, I think uh, there was some partnership, a number with 3M at 160 million uh, masks over a three or four month period. Is that is that a drop in the bucket or is that a substantial number that could kind of change the game? Uh, those numbers that we heard last night from the presidential task force. Do you, are you aware of those numbers? So we're working, I, I heard those numbers last night. We're working right now uh, to place an order this afternoon uh, as a collective group of about five companies for a mask order of almost 3 million masks. Um, and we're hoping to have those delivered next week. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Danny, it's kind of hard to project this thing out. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different graphs on it, but uh, really until uh, we can get, uh, you know, immunization for this and understand it better as far as what treatments can be. Uh, we, we believe that this event's going to move forward for another 60 to 90 days, um, just in terms of what the needs for these materials will be. Uh, one of the partners in this order we're working on now for 3 million, actually two of the partners in it are in the, the senior housing area. So they're in the, the senior uh, uh, residential type housing. Um, so they, they uh, forecast that they're going to have an extended need. And keep in mind, their facilities are on lockdown at present. Okay, so there's no one in, no one out other than their staff. So their current order and their needs are only for their staff. If there's a point in time that they open that back up and based on the latest guidance from the government, I think there'll be even more of a need for masks on a go forward basis. One thing to mention, if, if you get into the details of this, um, an N95 mask uh, requires a fit test. So there's an annual fit test process that you have to go through because it's not a very pliable mask when you think of a typical dust mask that you wear like an ear loop mask. The KN95 version actually is more pliable um, and does not require sizing and the fit test requirement that the N95 has. Um, I think the surgical masks are also going to be important uh, and, and they'll, they will have to be produced in a much larger quantity over time and probably for a longer duration than either the N95s or KN95s. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, we hope that, that you are able to find the supplies that you desperately need to supply those yeah. Again, um, you know, I, I worked uh, before I went to work for Team Health. I was in the construction business and worked with a lot of manufacturers in the East Tennessee area, and uh, always loved to see manufacturing stay uh, domestic in the U.S., especially you know in in, in my home state of Tennessee. Uh, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Tennessee College of Engineering uh, is my actual background, uh, even though I do procurement and other stuff now. So always uh, really, really great to hear about efforts to uh, keep manufacturing here and, and come up with new and innovative uh, ways of doing that. So uh, great, great to hear that this group's out there and, and trying to do what it can to uh, aid during this uh, epidemic. Thank you so much, Chris. So, uh, so Chris was our, our representative from the private sector uh, as far as uh, answering the question of, of who's gonna buy these products for us, uh, from us as manufacturers. So 
now we want to turn our attention uh, to uh, the the public sector uh, uh, leadership and, and in order to get a, a better sense for for what's going on uh, from the federal level and the state level uh, we've asked uh, Ke Kelly Boutwell from uh, the Tennessee Chamber uh, to join us uh, Kelly are you on the call Hey there, I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, thanks for being on the call. Could you just uh, just briefly you know, introduce yourself uh, and, and, and kind of describe what your the, the plan of attack uh, with your organization and how you're integrating uh, across the with other organ organizations across the state? Sure. And thanks for thanks again for having us. Um, inviting us to participate today in this webinar. So uh, Kelly Boutwell with the Tennessee Chamber of Commerce to give you an idea of, of who and what we are. So we serve this, as the State Chamber of Commerce in Tennessee and the State Manufacturers Association. Uh, we're a private, not-for-profit um, uh, business uh, group and we've got members all across the state of Tennessee and originally started as the State Trade Association for manufacturers before also uh, becoming the state chamber. Um, so that said, we represent business and manufacturers of all size, shapes and sizes uh, across the state of Tennessee. Um, I think Chris covered a lot of ground, um, but as a member-based organization, our members uh, with you know, the bulk of them being manufacturers reached out to us, started reaching out to say, hey, you know, uh, we want to help. Um, this was also coinciding with uh, the president uh, invoking the Defense Production Act. And uh, so we have been working in coordination with UTCIS. Our CEO, Bradley Jackson, is on the statewide task force uh, for the COVID-19 response in Tennessee. Um, and uh, we've been working with, of course, our national trade groups. We're the state affiliate for the U.S. Chamber, the state affiliate for NAM, and the state affiliate for the American Chemistry Council. Um, so uh, helping our businesses and manufacturers navigate who's essential, um, how they can um, uh, navigate that with their, within their own operations and communicating that with their employees. Um, but this newest piece is Last Wednesday, we officially, we officially launched Tennessee Creators Respond, which is um, modeled after a similar program from the National Association of Manufacturers. And um, talking with Paul and the UTCIS team, initially started out with a phone call and, um, and surveys to say, hey, uh, what can you make? I know you want to help. What can you make? What could you potentially retool? Um, so you can check out our webpage, uh, www.tnchamber.org. Um, if you want to go directly to the Tennessee Chamber response page, it's www.tnchamber.org slash response. And essentially this is meant to do a lot of what Chris said, which is to um, bridge the gap between the, the immediate needs in the state of Tennessee on the healthcare and provider side with the unique capabilities and capacities of manufacturers on the ground here in Tennessee. Um, and so there are essentially two paths. I'm a manufacturer, I want to help, or I'm a healthcare provider and I need help. And, uh, and from there, they fill out basic information. And a lot of what we're trying to do is to make those connections on the ability to collaborate. Because for example, one manufacturer may have um, a major piece of the final project product, um, but maybe they need a silicone piece to add to it and they don't have the capabilities. And in that case, we have been able to, uh, are, are starting to make connections among the manufacturers on the ground here in Tennessee. We've had a tremendous response and um, we're working through all of those connections, working with the healthcare providers. Right now, what we're hearing on the ground, uh, Chris covered, is uh, isolation gowns and N95 masks. And, um, and, and then on the flip side of that, if a manufacturer can provide something, are they gonna be able to provide it 
at cost that is even remotely competitive with the pricing that our providers have been um, been um, purchasing for years. So I think somebody asked a question. I can open up for questions now if y'all want more information. But we, we appreciate the tremendous partnership we've had with UTCIS um, in, you know, really brainstorming with, you know, what we can do within the state uh, to respond to this. Great. And uh, Misty is going, we've asked the participants to submit questions via sure. the chat feature. Okay. Um, and so Misty is going to try to uh, identify a couple of questions for you. And while she does that, uh, I'll, I'll just ask uh, uh, kind of the first question. You mentioned uh, some of those supplies, um, isolation gowns, for example. Could you kind of step us through if, if, um, if TEMA or, or some other organization were to uh, put out a, uh, you know, could you kind of step us through the procurement process, what that would look like in order for them to um, to get those supplies that they need and, and what, what the mm -hmm. timeline would that be? I don't have a timeline right now. Um, and, and I think that you're hitting at, at the, the biggest sort of challenge in this whole process. Um, you know, healthcare providers can tell us all day that they need isolation gowns, but what are the, design and material specs, what are the pricing specs. Um, so we need all of that to then in turn share with our manufacturers. That's one of been one of the biggest immediate challenges um, in getting the actual information. I've had some healthcare providers um, say that they are willing to take um, samples, have manufacturers send them samples overnight so they can certify it and make sure that it's, it meets their standards and then go from there. Um, but that is where I don't have a, a great answer for you there. We're working through that right now. Okay. Misty, do you have a couple of questions for Kelly? Uh, we do have one question and uh, Chris, you may also be able to help us with this one. Um, I'll just read it out. In the chemical industry, you couldn't work in an area that may require masks at some point, um, not usually using continuously. If you had respiratory challenges, should those people wear a preventive mask if that would affect their normal breathing so from <clears throat> that is correct so an n95 mask is not meant for continuous wear so that's why they're they're masking now at all times with a protective mask like a ear loop uh, level three surgical mask is what they're using and then they use the n95s uh, when they're actually in the areas where COVID is present a couple of the facilities in detroit and new york have switched over to COVID only and in those cases, they're actually moving over to P100 respirators uh, with the screw and type filter media um, is what they're moving over to. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we had one more about 3D printing. Uh, we're in a school with roughly 15 3D printers. Uh, we just want to 3D print and help. Do we have to print in a clean or sterile environment to print? I think it would, in my opinion, it would depend on the materials you're printing. So if you were printing up uh, the, the uh, headwear piece that goes on to a clear um, face shield, for example, no, you would not have to do that because they can sterilize that material when, once it uh, is produced. Okay, thank you, sir. And Kelly, we, we'll also, uh, in the follow-up email for everyone, we'll send a link uh, to the information that you talked about at the chamber as well as ours. So. So you guys will all have lots of resources to call on when you need help. So one thing I'll add real quick, this is Chris. Um, so under a typical emergency uh, declaration, uh, the act that's in place for reimbursement of PPE requires um, that you're an approved disaster area, which Tennessee has been uh, through presidential decree, I guess. Um, and then the actual funding for materials or supplies actually has to go through the state agency or local emergency management agency. This event is slightly different from the healthcare side because the CARES Act was passed, which actually allows for medical reimbursement related to COVID responses. Um, so what, what that has done for us is it opens up this opportunity for 
you know, PPE that's above and beyond what is typically uh, procured and needed for response uh, to, to our patients, uh, there's an opportunity for reimbursement for that that is included in the CARES Act. So that likely would affect the way in which uh, TEMA or other agencies would respond to this and potentially what their procurement of the PPE would look like. Okay. Uh, and then we had one other follow-up question with the face shields. Do they need to be sterilized? No, again, those can be sterilized when they're received at the facility. Okay. Fantastic. So if, uh, if you've just joined the call or if you've been on the call, what we're trying to do is uh, answer three uh, important questions. Uh, this first section, we were, we're completed with it. We're, we're uh, learning about uh, or learning from two uh, leaders, one from the private sector and public sector, um, who, who, who buys the products and, and how do we get the products to them. Um, and then we're gonna move, we're gonna, we're gonna do a quick overview um, of that. And then we're gonna move uh, uh, on into um, answering the questions, you know, is my own manufacturing operation um, uh, and to have the capability to uh, to pivot, and and then finally we're going to get into a, an uh, a large section just devoted to uh, a lot of the questions that are already uh, coming in around uh, regulations uh, associated with uh, PPE and medical devices. Uh, so just to just to recap this first section of our call, uh, contract opportunities. Uh, you know we've seen uh, private and federal opportunities and opportunities at the local uh, state and national level. And um, by that right now, I see it, I mean that we, we see needs. Uh, we, we're still waiting on uh, contract opportunities um, on the federal level in a lot of cases. Um, and if you wanna learn more, uh, Kelly uh, mentioned one uh, uh, website. We also are, are uh, encouraging folks to go to uh, this, uh, website URL here. So if you do have, um, um, uh, you want to help out, you can go to this survey and we can have your, your information on hand. Um, and we can provide that later um, in case you don't get it here. Uh, so next we'd like to uh, again turn our attention to uh, answering the questions of, uh, is this something that's feasible for my operation? Can can we answer uh, all the questions around uh, what what could we produce and how, you know, how much could we produce and um, can we make that sustainable for our business? And um, uh, we've asked uh, Russell Hubbard, uh, president of Proviva Laboratories to uh, share his experience. Uh, Russell, uh, we're really proud of the work that he's doing here in the state of Tennessee as a small manufacturer. We've uh, had a, a great relationship with him for a long time. And, um, and Russell has uh, really gone from uh, ground zero uh, uh, starting point uh, to producing a, uh, an innovative uh, surgical mask, I think this uh, mask alternative um, in, in a matter of days. And um, he's, he's really got a lot to share um, in a short period of time, but Russell, we thank you so much for being on the phone with us and sharing your experience. So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and about um, where you are now. Uh, we can barely hear you, uh, but I can make out what you're saying. Okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll speak up. I'm using the computer audio. Um, my background is different than most. I came out of the uh, United States Army Special Operations community in 2012, and I started the business that we have today. Uh, we simply identified a problem that was occurring in the military, particularly in training environments, where young uh, service members weren't accustomed to high levels of physical activity because they'd spend most of their time on their um, suddenly you got to run five miles, people were having heat strokes all over the place. And that became problematic. You, to treat a heat stroke, you have to treat it on the spot at the, at the time that it occurs, or there's going to be 
a catastrophic outcome. I mean, it's that simple. So we figured out a way to uh, develop a textile-based product that can be carried by the cadre or medics. And uh, in the event that that service member or some trainee goes down, they can immediately begin to cool them um, from that point of injury all the way through the logistical chain or the evacuation to a higher level of care. We just make sheets wet. So, you know, fast forward to 2020, we, uh, we had some, and I look at this as sort of like a military operation. So a lot of what I say may not make sense and you'll just have to forgive me. Um, we had some initial intelligence that uh, particularly Cardinal Health had a global recall on their gowns uh, that had occurred. And there was some, I don't know exactly what the problem was, but I believe it was a sterilization issue. So, you know, even before this COVID thing really got going, uh, there was already this problem in the supply chain. Um, so, you know, recognizing that, you know, what could come if we were already having a shortage of one particular item, you know, it's just going to, you know, the, the snowball's going down the hill, it's just going to get bigger. Uh, so we, you know, evaluated what our, you know, our small business capacities were, uh, you know, what strengths we had, what abilities we had, and we realized that we can make a textile-based mask out of the material that we're already using um, to accommodate for um, the rules and regulations, um, we, you know, had inquired and said, you know, you know, if, if we're going to do this, you know, you know, we're just, it's going to be a sanitary mask. It's not going to be, you know, a, a, a level three, you know, surgical mask or this and that. So what we did was we were able to source filter material uh, that was M100. So we could, we took our textile, we're able to fabricate it using the machinery that we have. We have a cut and sew shop, we send it over and it comes back and then we insert the, the filter media into the mask. So, you know, you, you know, you, essentially you have that, that, that type mask. When the user's done with it, they discard the the filter media that's in there and they sanitize and wash the carrier. Once it's dry, you can put a new piece in and you're ready to go again. So that's where we are. Have you, can you share just a little bit about the challenges uh, that you faced in ramping up and uh, getting production going and finding new customers? Sure. So yeah, so once we had identified it, a, uh, an engineering firm, a short fuse engineering, uh, here in Kingsport, uh, Dr. Uh, Justin Stacy, uh, is a friend of mine, and also you know a business associate. Uh, you know we uh, said you know we're looking at this, so we just created a novel design uh, that we knew we could manufacture. Um, we were doing it on a laser machine, a large format laser cutter that we have. Um, so you know we began doing it, and then we began running into issues of the repeatability we're going to have to uh we're going to have to uh stop russell we're having a difficulty hearing you uh, so thank you so much for for your time and again we applaud your efforts it's amazing what you've been able to accomplish in a matter of uh, uh just days really so again thank you so much russell and uh we wish you all the best as you uh as you provide these supplies so I'd just like to move into just a little bit more of, uh, you know, how can we do this? Um, this is, this is a, a projection of, of need, but it's also, uh, it's more uh, speaking to uh, the timeline. It's not so much um, what can we do, but when can we do it? How quickly can we do it? You see here, uh, this is a chart uh, from the IMHE that, uh, that everyone's kind of relying on as a projection for um, device needs. Um, and you see here, you know, uh, middle of April, the spike is going to happen. So we're, we're uh, what is it, April the 7th today. Um, 
we're, we're about to go through it. Uh, there will be uh, um, uh, needs going forward, uh, no doubt. Um, but uh, it just gives you a sense of the urgency uh, that's required. Um, and so if there is something uh, that you want to work out, you just got to be uh, cognizant of that um, moving forward. Um, speaking of things that you want to be cognizant of, um, um, we want to thank Georgia MEP uh, for kind of breaking this down for us. They did a great job earlier, uh, uh, later last week. Uh, but as a manufacturer, we've got to decide on uh, four key areas uh, to think uh, to think through the feasibility of producing something like this. And um, Russell Hubbard makes it sound easy, um, but uh, so we've got to figure out what what do we make? You know, the information, the materials, the machinery, and the people. Um, we got to make sure all that's lining up in order to uh, uh, produce something. And if there isn't something there. Uh, what what is who can we partner with? Uh, is there some license of an of an existing technology, or, or can we invent something um, to uh, kind of fill in the gaps? Um, and and then and so that's you know when it comes to filling in the gaps, that's what we're here for. Uh, UTCIS, we want to be a a partner. Uh, Kelly Boutwell also spoke to this. We want to be a a connector for people. Um, and, and, and really everybody, Chris Flynn uh, mentioned, you know, there's the, a lot of the partners that we relied on for material overseas is that they, they've dried up. So uh, production is coming online, even in the state of Tennessee for filtration materials. And uh, just, it's a, it's a very um, fluid process that we want to be a part of with you in uh, trying to get all these an uh, questions answered. And uh, I'm not going to speak through all of these, but we have heard, you know, uh, machines going down, machines being pro procured, new machines need to be broken in, old machines are old. Um, uh, all of the, the they're just, um, uh, you know, uh, lots of uh, unknowns out there as we move into each one, answering each one of these questions. And we want to be a, a a trusted advisor uh, as we move forward and, and answer these. Uh, so next, uh, so that kind of uh, rounds out our um, assessment of feasibility section. And now we want to devote the final section to uh, regulations. Again, we, we're, we're uh, very thankful for all of our partners. Uh, it's been an amazing time to be a part of the MEP National Network as we connect Tennessee manufacturers with other manufacturers across the, the country, and, um, and special thanks to uh, Gen Edge, um, uh, uh, Virginia MEP, for uh, letting us uh, play this. Uh, uh, we've got a recording for you. It's been edited. It's a really good. Darren Reeves, uh, DP Distribution and Consulting, is, uh, I, I believe, 30 or 40 years, perhaps, in uh, FDA um, certification realm and so um, I'll let uh, I'll stop my screen here so that you guys can uh, hear uh, hear from Darren and Missy's going to bring that up. So Danny while we're making that transition another question on the chat that uh, either Chris or maybe Kelly as well could speak to. Uh, the question is state FEMA agencies not only have lists of suppliers and clients but they also determine the gap between them. If there's a surplus of supplies, does anyone coordinate to share the surplus with other, other states? Kelly, did you want to comment on that one, maybe? Hey, uh, this is Kelly again. My comment to that is I, I think that's being done by um, your national group. Um, NIST and by our national group NAM in coordination directly with the White House. Um, but I've just read a Wall Street Journal article uh, this morning about uh, all of the talking about e exactly the gaps and um, the challenges with uh, FEMA being able to make official purchases with those that are offering. I can I can share that with y'all as well. So the challenge is real there. Chris may have other info. 
No, I, I believe that some of the states are starting to coordinate amongst themselves as they hear needs in other states and they're voluntarily doing it. Um, seems to be the way that's occurring based on what the needs are, but I'm sure FEMA is assisting in some manner. Okay, thank you both. Uh, so this next section that we're gonna have, it's a pre-recorded video from another webinar we did, but it has a lot of great information about, um, you know, class one, class two, what do I need to be certified to do and that kind of stuff that, uh, information that companies have been asking for. So we're gonna play this and then we'll wrap up the call with some uh, question and answer time after this part of it. So give me just a second and I'll get it going. Devices, there are all kinds of medical devices out there. As you guys know, specifically, we're gonna focus on the uh, PPE, the things that everybody's concerned about, these types of things that we've got listed on here. Um, there's a bunch of different terms out there. I wanna make sure everybody's familiar with what those terms really mean and what people are talking about when they're um, throwing the words out. All right, so the FDA breaks down all medical devices into three classes based on risk. And they're real engine, uh, they come up with these real good names, uh, the class one, class twos, and class three. And the class one is the lowest risk, class three highest risk. Uh, and amount of oversight that the FDA has on those devices will tell you it was based on the class. So the next slide I've got here really says, okay, if you've got a class one device, which we'll go over what those are in a minute, there's really no FDA oversight on those devices. We can get those into the market and we can help customers get those into the market almost immediately. We will have some facility concerns, but we can pretty much get those on the market very quickly. Uh, class threes, on the other hand, those are, require a, what we call a pre-market approval, and those cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to get in place. They're life-sustaining devices. You probably will not deal with that. Now you could deal with it in the future after this thing is over with, but just know that they exist. Uh, a lot of the problem child that we'll have with this uh, issue will be the class two devices. They require something called a 510K approval from the FDA. Um, that is something that we will submit information to the FDA in order to show that our product is as safe and effective as something that's already on the market. Um, so PPE, you hear a lot of that being tossed around. What is the PPE? It stands for personal protective equipment. Uh, you'll hear mo most everybody will say PPE. It's basically the, the gloves and the um, gowns and the head covers and the shoe covers and all that sort of thing. And it's to protect people from any kind of hazards. Uh, in our industry, specifically biological hazards. Uh, so it's a very common term in the industry. With respect to this pandemic, we're really talking about masks, face shields, gowns, gloves, coveralls. All those things are the PPE that we're referring to. Let's talk about some of the differences in what we've got. With masks, there are really two different types of masks with respect to the FDA. There are also other protective masks that you find in Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that, but they should not be for medical uh, purposes. They should be marketed specifically for, let's say, dust protection or something like that. The first one and the one that is actually the most coveted mask is what we call the N95 respirator mask. That is a class two if it was a surgical mask. Now, what the FDA has done, they got together with the CDC, and they put these under what we call an emergency use authorization. So no matter what intended use that mask has right now, you can put them on the market immediately, okay? So these are the coveted N95 respirators. They're also called respirators. Do not get a respirator and a ventilator mixed up. Uh, in the olden days, a ventilator was sometimes called a respirator. So people still do use those terms interchangeable. Uh, but a ventilator is that big piece of equipment that they're looking for and saying that we um, have a shortage of. And the N95 slash respirator is what's pictured on here. It's got that little filter in the middle of it, okay? So those can be put onto the market almost immediately. The secondary type of mask is what we, call, well, let me go back into the N95. The N, basically it means NIOSH. It's the organization that put out the, um, the, the test methods for those masks. 
You may also see a K in 95, which is a European equivalent. Those can also be put onto the market. Okay, so those are being brought in now. And the 95 means it filters out 95% of the airborne particulates. Those particular masks are designed to protect the user, not the patient. Okay, the second type of mask is really what we call a surgical mask, and some of this stuff is gray. Most masks, if they're for any medical claim, are going to fall into this category. Some have the ear loops like you see at the bottom left, and some have the ties. A lot of people will say that the ties are for surgical use and that the ear loops are for regular uh, procedure, patient procedure type of activities, and that's kind of how they use them. But the FDA has tied them all together in some of their guidance documents. Some people today are playing the gray, and they're not even calling for medical purposes anyway. But if you make a mask and you sell it to a hospital, you pretty much know what they're using it for. So it's a gray animal. We uh, have to go on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether they're coming from out of the country or whether they're making them uh, in, in the U.S. Sometimes, right now, pretty much anyone who's making these masks in the U.S. are able to sell them, but we can't get them into the country at this point from other countries. All right, so the, uh, all of these, Right now, you've got on the screen here are class one devices and can be sold almost immediately. Head covers, shoe covers, uh, scrub shirts, scrub pants, coveralls, patient gowns. Now, the patient gowns are not surgical gowns. The surgical gowns that you use in, these, uh, in the OR are a class two device and cannot be sold at this point, but patient gowns and can. And also, there's a difference between patient exam gloves and surgical gloves. Okay, so make sure that you, you understand the difference. If you have a customer or client that doesn't that wants to sell something, whatever it is today and in the future, what we can do is go into the FDA's database and immediately find out how they classify that device and what kind of regular control they have over it. I want to make one other little caveat here. Almost everything I'm telling you has some sort of an exception to it. There are some very small group of class ones that do require a 510k FDA approval. There are some class twos, actually quite a bit of class twos now, that do not have or require a 510K because they've been given what they call, um, uh, the FDA is not enforcing the, the requirements for the devices. So I, we can help you figure out what your client needs with respect to that with a quick phone call or email. Okay. Uh, again, they require, okay, they uh, are, regulated by the FDA, and they're usually the sterile products. So some people will sell them non-sterile to kit packers, but uh, if you have those issues, you can contact us so we can help you. Um, patient exam gloves are usually the ones that you see in the little boxes when you go into your doctor's office and they pull them out and, and use them during the exam. Um, again, some of these issues are very gray. Um, that's where expertise comes in to go through and help you learn where uh, the FDA's thought process is sometimes they put guidance documents out for different devices. Um, there's a lot of those issues out there that uh, we can help you with if you have specific questions. We can get into all of that during this presentation. There is something called an emergency use authorization, and that is where the obviously during this type of event, uh, one organization goes to another and says, can we use these things? From a medical device standpoint, the N95 industrial masks are in fact under the EUA, as well as those test kits that everybody's listening to or hearing about. A lot of those test kits are under EUA in order to get those onto the market very quickly. So those are the types of things that, uh, that have been going on. We're hoping that some other devices will get onto that, uh, that list or get onto, you know, get into a EUA situation. And I will keep people posted as uh, through the MEPs uh, as those come out. Um, okay, factory requirements. We know that this is not normal times. Um, typically and normally, every company that makes a medical product must follow the good manufacturing practices, the GMPs. The GMPs uh, for medical devices are called the Quality System Regulation. It's a QSR. Um, we are not in normal times. So, one of the things that we've seen and that can help is if is ISO 13485 or ISO 9001 certified, those are very, very close to the GMPs for medical devices. As a matter of fact, they both 
um, at the, MISO 9001 was the predecessor to the current GMP for medical devices. So what we need to do and address is find out whether the customer wants to be doing this short term or whether they want to continue doing it after the pandemic is over. If they're doing it short term, what I have seen done in the past was similar, not this type of situation, but similar uh, localized situations, is we can put in a quality plan or some sort of plan saying what, we, what we're doing to implementing things and go ahead and make and, and um, distribute those products as we're in the process of moving forward. Put in basic controls and we can move from there. It just depends on the organization and what they currently have in place. Okay, so usually putting in, we can also work under um, template SOPs so that we do have a system in place minimally and move forward to try to help with the, with the pandemic situation. Um, be very, very careful. The FDA does not approve devices unless it is a class three device. And then they will come in and actually uh, approve the device and the facility and the company cannot change anything after that. So the FDA so will not say your device is approved. They will, the 510K is a type of marketing approval which gives the company the ability to market that device, but it's not an FDA approval of the device itself. And the, the FDA does not, um, they do not approve your facility either. So when somebody says I have an FDA approved facility, most likely it's just that it's registered. Okay, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so for class one devices, they, you're supposed to have the QSR procedures involved in place. Um, and the company is supposed to register that facility. I'm checking on it now. I'm seeing a lot of companies just go ahead and it depends on whether you're going to go for short term or long term manufacturing. The cost to actually register your facility right now is a little over $5,000 for 2020 and it just continually goes up a little each year. So what we would need to do is see does this company want to actually make the products for, uh, for the long term or they're just doing it to help out the organization. I do have a question that exact question into the FDA now trying to figure out okay if we're just going to do this for the next three months do we need to register the facility I'm seeing it not being done and I'm seeing them not not enforce it at this point um, I can't definitively say that for on behalf of the FDA but that's what I'm saying okay um, and we can help register any organization out there that they want to start doing it long term so that's for class ones class twos basically same as class one but we need to get a 510k normally which means we get, we find something that's already on the market and we do the testing that's required to demonstrate that our product is on the market. I mean, is as safe and effective as that, what we call predicate. And what we're doing now is we're doing it simultaneously and we're seeing that it's being accepted by the FDA. We're actually um, submitting that paperwork and the testing. Once we've got the testing, we're then I've got several clients now that are, are marketing those products in order to help the pandemic, and I'm not seeing if any pushback from the FDA yet. Um, and for example, one also make you guys clear the ventilators that they're talking about, the equipment that GE is making now. They are a class two. They are not a class three. Okay, so the class threes are more along the lines of a, uh, an artificial heart valve or something that's, that's going to keep the patient alive. Or if it were to fail, it's definitely going to harm the patient adversely, in other words, kill them. Okay, so the, those ventilators are class two. Um, class threes, again, life-sustaining, probably won't deal with these. You typically, you'll need a class, uh, I mean, sorry, a PMA, which is the only approval the FDA But if you ever get into that, then you're going to need uh, additional support. Um, one unique item is that hand sanitizer and the alcohol that goes into the hand sanitizer. The FDA has written guidance documents for both of those, allowing for enforcement discretion with, under very strict guidance. Okay, so we're seeing now that a lot of the um, breweries, distilleries, and those types of things are trying to jump in to help offset their, um, their businesses and also help the, the pandemic issue and starting to try to make the hand sanitizer in their equipment because they're very well capable of doing it. Here's the two documents that are written for those on the very guidelines on the hand sanitizer 
and they have very specific guidelines on how to um, allow the manufacturing of the alcohol, uh, but they are using enforcement discretion, which means they, are, they will not um, go in and adversely affect any business that's following these guidelines. If you do make the alcohol, they are asking that you register with the FDA just so that they know that you're doing it, but they have no intent of going into uh, an, and auditing your facilities. Okay, uh, as we said, things are changing daily. Um, there may even be something in this new bill that just passed on the uh, ability to uh, manufacture face masks. Uh, as we get additional information, we will pass this out to the MEP and get that information out to you guys. I know. All right. All right, Danny, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, I do have a really good Q&A that goes along with that video that I'll send out. We'll send out to everybody in a follow-up email. Um, and it also show you, we had a couple of questions, you know, is our N95s class one or class two, face shields class one, class two, that kind of stuff. It'll show you how to look up that information and, and some of the, the questions that go with that type of stuff. So I'll send that out in the follow-up email. Danny, you're muted. There okay. You go. Thanks so much, Misty. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, great. And again, thanks again to Darren Reeves and uh, Jen Edge, uh, Virginia MEP. Uh, he would have been on the call uh, live. He just said he, he couldn't do it any better uh, than the recording. So he is available to Tennessee manufacturers for, uh, um, for questions. And um, there was a lot of gray area, obviously, as you heard. Um, and uh, so we can connect you with him if uh, the recording didn't uh, answer your question. Uh, so thanks again uh, to everyone for uh, being on the call. Uh, that, that concludes our call today. Uh, we had uh, uh, three sections, uh, a section on uh, what are the needs out there, who's buying these products, uh, what's the timeline, uh, we had a, a, a brief section on uh, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what is this feasible for uh, your operation? And then we uh, dove into and heard from uh, a regulation specialist uh, to try to figure that, to try to figure out that kind of type of thing because we see so much uh, that to be a common uh, theme as far as questions that are that are concerned. And um, we'd also like to just. Uh, uh, let you know that uh, we're here to help as you uh, move forward and uh, please contact us if you have any questions. We also want to make sure that you fill out this survey, uh, surveymonkey.com uh, uh, forward slash r forward slash cv19 critical supply. That is uh, the survey that is a part of our national nationwide effort uh, with the Na uh, MEP National Network to uh, combine forces and get supplies to the areas that need them most. So again, thank you so much for being on the call and uh, we appreciate you.